I'm now joined by the Minister uh, of ICT from Rwanda. So, Madam Minister, thank you for being with me. So, talk to me a little bit about the work you're currently doing in your country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we are very focused on leveraging uh, technology in really driving the different sectors of the economy. And so for us, technology is an enabler. We've put in place the foundations, the infrastructure uh, that connects uh, most of the people, and we continue to invest extensively in ensuring that everyone in Rwanda is not left behind. Everyone has access to reliable infrastructure. Last mile connectivity is possible. And so that is some of the work that we're already doing, but that can only be possible because of some of the foundational infrastructure that we invested in about 15 years ago. We are a country, when we look at the technology landscape and what really we, are stand, we stand for and what we aspire to be, is to be a technology hub, a leader in the, uh, in the continent when it comes to technology innovation. However, to do that, we've had to really uh, understand what exactly differentiates us from everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we coined um, you know, the, the, the ambition of being a proof of concept hub uh, for the continent. And so what we do is we welcome you know, businesses, startups, innovators to really come and test and try their digital innovations, their solutions that are enabled by digital technologies in Rwanda. And hopefully, because they are addressing real world problems, they are addre addressing challenges that are not unique to just Rwanda, then we know that scale will be possible because if you respond to healthcare access, everyone on the continent is grappling with that. And so if you're able to find a solution that is a good fit on how we can ensure accessible, affordable and quality healthcare, leveraging technology, then there are very high chances that this is a solution that is scalable uh, to the rest of the country. The, the, other the, the, the possibilities for technology that you've just laid out, the potential there is huge mm -hmm. and obviously a lot of progress is being made, but there are still too many people who don't have access to technology. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to close this gap between the haves and the have-nots? So there are two uh, streams. There is people who don't have access because they don't live in areas that are very well covered with a good uh, signal. Mm -hmm. And so that is an, an infrastructure problem. So what we are doing is working with our operators and even government putting in uh, in money is to ensure that we close the coverage gap. Today, right. uh, our coverage gap uh, has been about 86% when it comes to um, um, uh, geographic coverage, but when you talk about population coverage, then we are over 90%. However, what we really our ambition is let's have 100% geographic coverage. There's a lot of mobility happening in any mm -hmm. part of the country, so we can't concentrate just on uh, um, population coverage. Then there is people that are not connected they live within, you know, they, they, they have a signal, but they're not connected because of may, mainly two barriers. They don't have the digital literacy skills. Affordability is a challenge. So basically they can't afford a basic device like a smartphone that will right. allow them to access mm -hmm. some of these services that are de delivered online. So that's a usage gap. So. On the infrastructure side, it's a coverage gap that we're working to close, and we're hoping that within the next two to three years, we've closed that gap, because once we've sort of sorted out coverage, then we can focus on how do we create value for people to see the benefits of using digital. The bigger gap that we have is on the usage gap, where we have about 27% of our population that is connected in, in the sense that they are using this uh, broadband connectivity meaningfully. The rest are either getting those services through a third party or someone else, and so that gap, we can only close it by accelerating the digital literacy programs that we're doing in the country, ensuring we're putting in place device financing um, uh, instruments that allow for any citizen, regardless of where you are in a rural part and you can't afford to pay upfront the cost and what we're doing that is interesting for rural parts is you're bundling it not just the phone and the data but for certain places you're also bundling it with a solar panel because electricity access is also still a challenge so really figuring out uh, how we close on the usage gap and these are some of the um, interventions that we are making to close the usage gap so being at a conference like this is obviously very important because you have the private and the public sectors mm -hmm. and and an opportunity to tell the world what you're doing but also get investment mm -hmm. what do you hear from people as one of the biggest obstacles that they have to investing I think the biggest obstacle that we keep hearing is um, market size. We're talking about a population of 13 million people, so for some uh, companies and investors that are probably looking for a market to expand to, um, uh, the 13 million market uh, size doesn't become exciting for them. 
what we do then is where we actually, when we started to come up with a proof of concept strategy, it was basically because we're getting that kind of feedback and we said, look here, even if you already have solutions, you're a company or an investor, you've invested elsewhere, the reality when you're coming into emerging economies and, de and developing countries is that you're going to need a place where you can prove the success of the products mm -hmm. and services that you want to provide. So we've told them, we understand there is the challenge of having a 13 million market, but there's also the other side that we need to look at, which is you get the opportunity to showcase how you're creating impact with a smaller market size. That's what you always need to do to create, you know, uh, interest from the other countries on the on the continent. But two, we also have the benefit that because we are part of bigger regional blocks and the continental free trade area, you know, agreement and framework that we have in place, it's now a bigger market of 1.4 billion people. So think about it as I'm starting with 13 million people, but this is how I'm going to be supported to access the remaining, um, you know, 1.3 billion. Uh, that are there on the continent. Absolutely, because this is setting a precedent now for those other countries to follow. So from your position, have you seen any concrete changes from this Africa Free Trade Agreement? Because it sounds great on paper, mm -hmm. but what about in practice? Yeah, there, I mean, we've, we've seen some very concrete ones. And of course, I, I think the agreement in itself provides a framework through which mm -hmm. we can unlock the market potential uh, that the continent uh, you know, offers. Um, there are many things that we need to do as governments, as uh, you know, collectively. Uh, there are policies that need to be in place. So let's even take a step back and think about the digital space. When we talk about the continental free trade uh, agreement and we're talking about uh, trading across borders, what we're seeing is the a very huge potential for digital technologies to enable that trading across borders. When you do that, you have to tackle things like cross-border data flows, um, mm -hmm. because I'm buying something in one country that is found in another country, it has to be shipped and all of that. There's data that is flowing across the board, and so how do you ensure that you have uh, proper mechanisms in place to handle uh, the, you know, the flow of data across different borders? So for me, I think it gives us a perfect um, you know, opportunity. I know the, the, there is, um, I think there's a need to see things much quicker, but I think what people are not realizing is that all the heavy lifting that needs to be done to ensure that we have a perfectly seamless market that then allows for businesses mm -hmm. to happen. And, and I think we're really in the right direction. Uh, it, it, we're, right, we're in the right direction. We're already seeing that happening even within the different regions. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think the future is very bright when it comes to the continental free trade area framework. And I have to ask you, so as a woman, a woman in leadership, how important are women leaders in, in, in really sh shaping and being the architects of the Africa that we want to see? So as a starting point, we make up more than 50% of the African population. So we need to be in places where decisions are made. Women need to be there because you want to ensure that their voice is heard when these decisions are being made. Uh, just yesterday, I was at a session that was really looking at how do we drive, um, you know, financial independence for women, um, and so really understanding: do we need to have, you know, it, you may need, you may not need to have. Um, you know, a different set of products. In certain cases, yes, it's, in, it's important that you have a different set of financial products that are, is targeted for women, but that's also because we are seeing them lagging behind in terms of being financially included. But at least uh, what it allows when women are in, in such decision-making uh, 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 platforms, it allows for a different perspective mm -hmm. to be brought onto uh, the, the decision-making table, which is very important. And I would even argue that it's not just women, you need people, you need the, the different groups that typically have the tendency of being left out when decisions are being made and when solutions come to the market, you realize, okay, this is not a good f fit for a certain segment, people in rural populations, people with disabilities. And so how do we ensure that everyone's voice is heard? And so I think for me, that's very important. I, the other thing is, I guess, which is uh, um, uh, quite interesting is also, we just uh, this year we hosted the um, the fintech investment forum, the very first one in Africa, and so. What was interesting about it was a very, um, you know, glaring statistic around uh, women tech businesses and or women businesses that were finding it difficult to access uh, financing uh, instruments. And so one of the thing, one, one of the studies that was done is that when you look at the VCs and you see that most of them are 
heavy on male decision makers, which obviously means that when a decision is being made on who we decide to fund versus the other, then a certain voice will never be heard or a certain perspective will never be taken into consideration. So we really need to advocate for more women, for more young people, because mm -hmm. we're talking about the future that we want. Young people must also be uh, at the table because that future we are creating, they will be the ones that are going to <laughs> be Absolutely. living in it. And, and we need to make sure that we understand what they need. And so finally, what is your message to those young women and girls who are out there who are watching? What, what do you want to tell them so that they can be those people at the table? I think my message is simple. Um, uh, one, it, you know, you can be what you want to be. You just have to believe in yourself. Uh, you just have to believe in yourself. You just need to identify who are those role models that for you will allow you to really push yourself out, out of the comfort zone. But then there's no limit to what you can and cannot do. I love that. Believe in yourself. A great message. Thank you so Thank much, you. Madam Minister. Thank I appreciate you. it. Appreciate Thank it. You.